think we can get started. So hello everybody and uh, welcome to the Canadian Association of Research Libraries webinar on uh, introduction to Canadian copyright and open licensing for OER. We are uh, lucky to have our presenter today, Amanda Wakarak, who is a copyright librarian at the University of Alberta. During the session, please make sure that you have your um, microphones on mute just so that we're not hearing um, back chat and that. Uh, any questions that you have, please place them in the group chat and I will keep track of them and we will make sure that Amanda can answer them towards the end. So um, that is all and I guess I'll let Amanda get started. Great, thanks Saren. I'm very happy to be here today. I uh, will be, as you can see from the slides, I'm going to be talking about Canadian copyright and open licensing for OER. I have been working as a dedicated copyright librarian for about just over four years now, um, but I bumped into copyright in many capacities before this, both with my work with government information and also as, um, as I was seconded for two short-term roles managing a digital repository services system and an OJS at, um, uh, platform here at the University of Alberta. So uh, I think it's probably obvious to everyone that I'm not a lawyer and I can't provide legal advice on copyright or anything, but I can certainly talk about what academic librarians need to know about copyright and open licensing and specifically in the OER environment. Um, now, because we're being recorded uh, I, and this webinar mode is not really lend itself to interactivity as much as others, I will be looking down at my notes occasionally, so I apologize for that. That's not something I normally do, um, but uh, just a heads up there. Uh, so I thought I'd start with a bit of a mini lecture about copyright, just so we're all on the same page and then move into copyright implications about OER in particular. So we'll talk a little bit about ownership, we'll talk a little bit um, about exceptions to infringement as it relates to the use of third-party content in OER. At the very end, have a short discussion about risk management in that capacity at an institutional level. Um, so we obviously can't dig into in any depth into the more sort of interesting areas of copyright. So what I'm going to do at various points in the presentation is um, link to opening up copyright instructional modules. So you'll see a box come up on the screen and I won't follow it as part of the presentation, but that's a heads up that there's an instructional module related to the topic uh, I just mentioned or that was mentioned on a slide. And you can do a deep dive into, into the issue or the topic through there. These are modules that were created as part of the opening up copyright project here based here at the University of Alberta. I've been um, a member of the content team for that project for the last three years. Um, they are very broad in scope and try to reach out to multiple audiences. Um, they're different than the CARL uh, copyright OER for university instructors and staff, which I think you'll be seeing PR about shortly. So CARL's series of instructional modules slash tutorials on copyright are very focused on the needs of employees in university settings. So these are complementary tools for copyright literacy in Canada that are being developed right now. So just a heads up, you're going to be seeing some of that. Um, but before we start, I do want to take advantage of Zoom's small interactive elements with the chat. And I'm going to throw it out to everybody. So be close to your chat, okay? Get your fingers ready. Um, in one or two words, just tell me what you think of when you hear the word copyright. I'll give people a minute or two to do that. And I'm watching. I wish I didn't know who was typing what, but uh, it'd, still be, it'd still be fun. Okay, I'm hoping everybody else can see this too coming up. Restrictions, complexity, protection, legislation, hard, it certainly can be. Uh, Protection for authors, absolutely. Employment, especially for uh, IP lawyers, I think, in these days. Access and permission. Oh no, yeah, that kind of copyright chill and anxiety can certainly be a big part of our, our lives. Uh, a bundle of rights for using content. Yeah, this is um, this is all what I was hoping to see. This is frontline uh, responses here. Challenging, it can be, and that's why we have this webinar series. Um, yeah, there can be problems and we're here to help uh, prevent some of the problems you might run into as librarians working with OER in particular. 
So um, I see Roger's piped in there, balancing creator user rights. You got it, Roger, that's a great segue. Um, I'm gonna frame it uh, theoretically, and then we're gonna dive into some more practical, but for this, just off the top, copyright is an enclosure mechanism, and the Canadian Copyright Act is a policy instrument created by Parliament. Now, all policy instruments, including legislation, are enacted in the public interest. Now, for those of you who remember your poli-sci or social sci days, uh, these are tools of peace, order, and good government. And they're enacted to serve the common good. Now, when we talk about copyright, that's achieved by um, keeping two competing sets of interests in balance. So, in theory, providing rights holders with um, an extensive, um, you know, package of rights, the sole right to reproduce, produce, publish, perform, as you can see, is supposed to, in theory, incentivize the creation of new of new works. That is balanced by allowing others to make some very limited uses of the work. So these are usually referred to as users' rights. So if we're using other people's stuff, we may be leaning on these users' rights, but they are incredibly limited uh, in, in nature compared to uh, rights holders' rights. So I think the easiest, uh, there are some people that would describe users' rights as um, a safety valve for society, a kind of pressure release system. And I think that's most obvious when we're talking about uses for criticism, review, uh, freedom of expression. And given that today is the United Nations Human Rights Day and UNESCO just passed a recommendation on OER, I think it's worth noting that multiple international conventions recognize education as a human right. And OER helps, um, helps move forward realization of that human right. So it, it's really important for us as librarians to understand how OER and copyright um, serve those broader goals. And, and I think you'll, this is, gets incredible, even more interesting, excuse me, when we consider that these are intellectual assets, not concrete property uh, in, a, in a traditional sense. And that's one of the reasons I think copyright theory can be really interesting, but it's way beyond the scope of what we can do here today. So there's that first box for a module. Um, bringing it back down to the practical, another way to think about copyright in Canada and copyright law is to start with the act. We have uh, a federal act that sets out rights, and I'm going to give you like one or two sentences, very high level, and then we're going to unpack it. So don't be scared off if, if the, the high level sounds a little dense. Um, the act uh, lays out very, very heavy rights, exclusive rights for rights holders in the first couple of sections and basically says that if you as a user use a substantial amount of a work owned by someone else, it's copyright infringement. So that could even be me taking a screenshot, a screenshot of the website you see in front of you, unless what I'm doing or what you're doing can be said to be covered by an exception to infringement. So those are listed on the screen in front of you. Some of these exceptions are very clearly worded, some are not, and that is intentional. Um, so there's opportunity for confusion or interpretation, depending on where you're sitting in this, this community, in this, this context. And when rights holders and users disagree about what, let's say, is fair dealing, or let's say what an educational institution exception might mean, um, then the courts can get involved. The rights holder has a right to place a claim of infringement, and if it makes it to the court level, um, or to a court of law, I should say, it, um, it, it results in a judgment that helps us understand a bit more about what's going on. So that's what you should be thinking of when you when someone says copyright law. So when you hear copyright law in Canada, it's a combination of legislation which sets out statutory rights for both rights holders and users and um, and case law that helps us better interpret and understand what the legislation is telling us. That's the very high level. Uh, let's let's unpack this a little bit. So I've given you sort of the Coles Notes version on the screen in front of you, um, but let's consider the, the slides that you're looking at right now. When I put this presentation together, copyright was immediate. As soon as my ideas were expressed in fixed form on this presentation, copyright existed. Okay, so I have, as the rights holder, the sole right to produce, reproduce, etc. these works. Uh, that's a time-limited right, though. It only lasts for the course of my life, plus 50 additional years, and then this work is open to anyone to use in any way. 
Um, so I could also transfer these rights uh, if I wanted to, if, if I wanted to publish this and, and perhaps the publisher wanted to take some of these rights for the purpose of publishing, I can do that. Uh, that's my choice as a rights holder. But I want to stress, and this is especially important for OER work, uh, employers are the default rights holders under the Act. So my employer would have owned the rights of this work, not me, except for an agreement to the contrary. My union negotiated with my board of governors to um, create an agreement that made it clear that as a member, that me as a member of the faculty association or rather the academic staff association, uh, I have the right to copyright in the works I produce in the course of employment. That's something you need to figure out at your institution, like where those rights lay if you're working with OER development. And we'll talk a bit more about that later. Okay, so you can use my work um, if you want, but it may not be legally defensible. It depends on what you're doing. Uh, if you take my, my slides and you share them on the open web and try to claim that it's for an educational institution exception, you might have a problem making that claim because the educational ex institution exceptions make it very clear that it's only going to support use to students, faculty in a very limited way. That's why we don't really hear so much about that exception when we're talking about OER. Rather, for the use of third-party content or other people's stuff in an OER, you, you generally hear about fair dealing, and we'll talk more about that later. But for now, just think of that as the more expansive um, exception that when we're talking about OER. Okay, so some of the language, as I've said, is a little different. Um, I mean, a little bit clearer or less so intentionally in exceptions, and the courts help us clarify um, the points of law. Now, we don't have any OER specific on point legis or sorry uh, jurisprudence in Canada, so we don't um, we don't have that clarity. But one thing we don't need a lot of clarity about is um, um, who can assign the rights to an open license and make something OER because this is the definition of an OER. Uh, open educational resources are teaching, learning, and research materials in any medium, digital or otherwise, that reside in the public domain or have been released under an open license. Full pause for a second. That C in the license is something, and the, first of all, I, I bolded the dark letters, but also that C is very Canadian. I gotta add this to every slide or every presentation on this. Um, if you see discrepancies between the spelling of license uh, here and in the US and international, just be aware that our CP guide uh, wants us to use a C for a noun and an S for a verb. And I'm sorry, I wish I could unlearn this, but I can't. And now I, it's just one of these things that, that is a part of my reality as a copyright librarian. So got to get that out of the way. Um, now, if you uh, were, were a student at the beginning of this presentation, you would notice that I have assigned an open license to this presentation. So if you wanted to use it, you wouldn't have to. You wouldn't have to worry about asking permission or uh, worry about an exception to infringement at all because as the rights holder, I've made this presentation available with an open license. And as long as you follow the terms of that license, you're good to go. And that's at the heart of OER. OERs are by definition, as you see on the page, um, permitting reuse, adaptation and redistribution by others with no or limited restrictions. Okay, so that open license is how I've made this presentation an OER. That's the definition. Another way that you can say something is an OER is if it's in the public domain from a copyright perspective. This is a very specific phrase in copyright uh, parlance. It's not um, publicly available. A lot of people make that conflation. It's in the public domain means that copyright um, rights are no longer associated with the work and that can happen in a few different ways but um, suffice it to say that something's an OER when it's openly licensed in a way that allows it to be reused or it's in the public domain. All right so let's get into the nitty-gritty. As an academic librarian you're working with people who are developing OER the first thing I hope you understand is who holds the rights um, in the educational resources developed at your institution because that's going to inform uh, the decision-making around what kind of open licenses are assigned to the work. 
uh, this can this information can sometimes be found in collective agreements or institutional policies. So if you're working in this space, it is in your best interest to to understand how IP is treated at your institution. Um, this may also vary for collaborative works. Like here at the U of A, the staff the fa uh, sorry the academic staff association has different language around IP and copyright from our support staff association. So if we have people from both classes of um, employment working on a project, there that's a, that's a consideration. That's something that needs to be clarified before we can assign a license, because only the rights holder can assign a license to the work. I should stress it hasn't caused any problems, but it's just something to be aware of, at least not, not here and that I've heard of. Um, does the rights holder want to make their educational resources open? This is something else you need to consider. Um, there may be good reasons not to share everything as openly as, as some librarians assume it should be. And that's a conversation that you need to have. It, or you may be working with material that has already been assigned um, uh, some rights to a publisher as part of a publishing agreement. And that's a whole nother conversation, <laughs> the relationship between publishers and the author is, um, is, is, is something that actually the Authors Alliance in the US has done a lot of writing about. So at the very least, if, if you're working with a faculty member who is also publishing the work and wants to make it OER, be aware that the basics, the OER basics listed on the screen should be worked to that publishing agreement. And the easiest way to do it often is to assign an open license. Some publishers are going to be more um, open to this than others. So selecting a publisher, if the route, that's the route you want to go, um, is, is an important consideration. Of course, there are a lot of libraries working with open publishing, which makes that path a lot easier than it used to be. But be aware that if you're, you're working with a publishing agreement, you want to retain the uses that are consistent with OER. So I've said, I've been using the phrase open licenses a lot. And, and um, I, I want to be sure that we're all on the same page about what an open license actually is. Uh, you can see the definition on the screen there. Uh, they basically grant permission to use a copyright protected work with few or no restrictions, um, and that can allow for uses. So open licensing then is a core infrastructural element of OER. It doesn't change the copyright status of the work at all. It is something that only the rights holder can assign, and it's basically telling the world that they can use that work in specific ways. So that's the difference between other types of licenses, one of the differences between other types of licenses and open licenses. Most licenses librarians work with are between very specific parties. So if you have something, um, if you're working with a corporation to license library resources, there's, it's very clear who the parties are and, and what the terms are, et cetera. Open licenses are similar in that there are terms of use that need to be respected. Um, but the difference is that it's between the rights holder and the whole world. So in that way, it's open. Um, also open because those terms of use are generally providing very few restrictions and hopefully they're providing uses that that um, you know make it clear that those those five R's are available. All right, so Creative Commons licenses are um, the most common OER open licenses, but not all Creative Commons licenses are actually OER compatible. We're going to get into that in a moment, but for now, I just want to make it clear that Creative Commons is um, three things, as you will learn if you take the CC certificate, which is linked at the end of this presentation. Um, first of all, in my mind anyway, it's a global network and a movement. So it's a community of practitioners and legal experts, educators, advocates that come together, hopefully, um, you know, um, virtually, definitely on Slack and other channels, but um, also in person at the summit every year. And they talk about the open movement and, and their role in it, etc. CC is also a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to building a globally accessible public commons of knowledge and culture. So that's sort of their, their, their mission and their mandate in the world. And one of the main ways they do that is by creating a set of legal tools that we keep talking about, these open licenses. Um, and um, and I, I kind of went over this already, so I'm not going to belabor the point, but it's there for your notes. 
Um, interesting side note, CC was a response to a legislative change that was seen as an overreach on the part of rights holders in the US. And there's a lot of information about the history of Creative Commons on the certificate program. Really interesting um, sort of snapshot of what was going on in the States and, and now the world, because I should mention that these are internationally um, respected licenses that work with different national systems of copyright law. So that was intentional. And, um, and there's much more about that on the, the course if you're interested. Okay, so these are the licenses on the screen. Uh, I'm just trying to move stuff around here. Um, I've taken this actually from a book that Rajiv edited that he talked about last week. Uh, Cable Green created this image. And, and if you're, you've never seen this before, um, I've been told they look like hieroglyphics, so they're a little dense and a little hard to understand. Um, but basically what you're seeing are, are what we call buttons. These are Creative Commons buttons that tell us as users what the rights holder is okay with us doing. So the CC obviously means Creative Commons. Um, not carbon capture or whatever, whatever other CCs might mean to you. Um, and then the little circles to the right of the CC tell you which specific elements the rights holder has assigned in the license. So by simply means attribution. And we're going to take a closer look at CC by in a second, but for now it's enough to just know that, that if you see a CC by, you have a broad uses available to you, but you must provide attribution. You must allow for that uh, impact um, aspect of the visibility and impact. We hear a lot about open licenses, improving visibility and impact, and that's very true. Uh, but for impact to be part of the conversation, attribution is essential. Uh, so that's what this license is saying. We move down to the SA, which is the little circle basically means that if you use this work and you change it, you adapt it to the point where it stands alone as a new work, um, you must provide attribution, but also assign the same license to it, okay? So the next one down is CC by NC, so non-commercial is pretty much what it sounds like. This is something, and you see that the line is through that uh, dollar sign, so it, it means that commercial uses are not supported by the license. Um, but they would be if it was just a CC BY license, right? And then we have combinations of these things, so CC BY and CSA. And finally, the two that are not OER compatible at all. And that would be the uh, element no derivatives added to either the standard CC BY or CC BY and C. So if someone has assigned a no derivatives license, that means that you as a user cannot share adaptations or derivative works made from the original, based on the original. And that's important um, for us to know as OER uh, practitioners, because it's not compatible with the five R's, right? You can't remix, you can't remix and share. So those are not OER compatible and, uh, and that can cause confusionism and is important. Another thing that can con cause confusion is that the SA and the ND only trigger when a work has been adapted. So if you're including an image in an OER and it has an SA license, that's okay. You don't have to assign the entire OER textbook or whatever it is with the same license if you're not changing the work. They're not changing the image, rather. You should say it's best practice to make it clear that that image has the SA license, but if you're not adapting it, you're not triggering that element. Um, and that's an important distinction that I've seen cause a lot of confusion. Another thing that can cause a bit of confusion is that public domain status at the top, I kind of left this to last, it is certainly the most free and as we know from earlier conversation, public domain means that there are no rights associated with copyright um, associated with the work. But uh, that marker that you see on the screen indicates that it doesn't tell us how the work came into the public domain. It just says that someone has determined that it's in the public domain. There's also something called a CC zero waiver, which if I see it would tell me that the rights holder has waived their rights. So the public domain status could be the rights holder waiving the rights. It could be that the term has expired. Um, it could be something else. Um, so I'm not sure if that's useful, but just a side note that doesn't seem to get covered in other spaces.
So this is a suite of licenses from Creative Commons that you're probably going to bump up against as you're working with OER. And it's only those four, CC BY, CC BY SA, CC BY NC, and NCSA BY, <laughs> that are OER compatible. So keep that in mind when you're working with faculty that are developing new, new content. All right, so as I promised, we're going to take a close look at that CC BY license. And as you can see from the language, um, it, it says to us as users that we are free to share, copy, and redistribute the medium material in any medium or format, uh, adapt, remix, transform, and build upon the material for any purpose, even commercially. So that's, those are pretty broad uses. Um, it basically would support anything you're doing with an OER. Um, it also says that the licensor cannot revoke these freedoms as long as you follow the license terms. So it's permanent. Once this CC BY license is on there, that's it. Uh, it's out there with those permissions. And as a, somebody who's developing OER, it's, it's your response. I, th I think we're responsible to make sure the rights holders understand that, that when they're assigning these licenses, they are irrevocable and allow for very broad uses. Now, obviously, there are some terms associated with this. And with the CC BY, they're pretty straightforward. Really, you must give appropriate credit, which is just good academic practice anyway, of course. Um, but that is the term of this license. So if you're going to use this work, you must provide attribution, which they define as appropriate credit, provide a link to the license, and indicate if changes were made. Um, and you may do that in any reasonable manner, but not in a way that suggests the licensor endorses you or your use. Okay, so if you took, I'm a licensor of this, this presentation, you took my presentation and you changed the, the sequencing or whatever, and I think it doesn't make sense anymore, um, you can't say that I endorse it. You can't make it seem like I'm the one who, who put that sequencing in place. You have to make it clear that you changed the sequencing, for example. Um, and you may not apply any additional restrictions. So they note technological measures here uh, and other legal restrictions that would prevent other people from using the work in the way I wanted them to or I wanted to make sure they could. So an example here would be assigning or using DRM that prevents people from making copies. So if you crack down or, or you know, limit people's ability to copy the work, then, then that's not supporting the license. And as the rights holder, theoretically, I could um, make a claim of, um, of breach of contract for the terms. And there's a lot more information on that on the Creative Commons website. Um, yeah, so that's about it. There are a couple of notices here that are worth, worth noting. Um, so telling the user they do not have to comply with the license for elements of the material in the public domain. So uh, a lot of the photographs I've used in this presentation are actually Pixabay and CC0, and I note that at the end, so that's not going to be subject to the CC BY license I've applied to the whole thing. And, um, or were your uses permitted by an applicable exception or limitation? So the license is there and giving us way more freedom to reuse this material than the all rights reserves default status of, of copyright in, in Canada. Uh, but it doesn't prevent you from leaning on the exceptions to infringement if those exceptions allow for uses that aren't covered by the license. But I think in the OER realm, that's rare. CC BY is usually providing us with pretty much everything we need to reuse and remix and create new OER. Uh, what else have we got here? Okay, no warranties are given. The license may not give you all the permissions necessary for your intended use, and this is something that, that we bump into in other ways, of course, as well. So this isn't talking about publicity or privacy or moral rights. Those are different conversations that, honestly, I don't see a lot of, um, um, of space in this presentation for, but we can talk about that if you're interested. All right, so that's the most permissive of the CC licenses, completely supportive of, of OER use, either as a user or as a developer of OER materials. This is the most restrictive of the CC licenses, the CC BY and C and D. So it says, yes, you are free to share and copy, but then things change a little bit when we look at the terms. Attribution is still there, nothing's changed there. Non-commercial has been added, which is fairly straightforward, although I can answer questions if, if you disagree that it's straightforward later. Um, no derivatives, this is the big difference. This is why the license is not compatible, because it says if you remix, transform, or build upon, you may not distribute the modified material. And an OER is not an OER if you can't distribute it. 
right? So everything else is the same. Um, so that's the big distinction there. So watching the time. All right. So we heard two weeks ago, um, oh gosh, I've blanked on her name. I think it was Sophie, Josie. Josie was talking about accessibility issues related to OER and, um, and how overcoming some of the barriers requires leaning on technology, which is fairly simple, but it's still a threshold, a bit of a barrier. Rajiv talked about institutional policies last week, and of course that takes some institutional support <laughs> to, to make that kind of work happen. Uh, and, and I just want to sort of lead by saying, this slide by saying that OER is really just about willingness. Like the signing a CC license to create an OER is really just about willingness of the rights holder, because groups like CC make it super easy to assign a license. There's no registration process. You simply pick the license that is appropriate and you mark it with the CC button. They've got a really easy to use, see, choose a CC license feature on their website. You just put it on the, the material and make sure it's linked back to the license deed so that the user can read it and that's it. So really the only barrier to creating OER from an intellectual property perspective is willingness and obviously the rights in the first place. So if you're the copyright owner, if you own the copyright in the work, it's really just about willingness after that. Assigning a CC license is very simple. Um, and it's best to inform people who are using your work that it exists. So I've just pulled something down off the um, Commonwealth of Learning website. This is a book produced by Sanjaya Mishra from the and in so association with the Commonwealth Education Media Center for Asia. You can see um, on the page, the next page after the title page, there's actually a, uh, the CC by SA license. And then they've made it very clear who the copyright holder is. And that's, that's important and useful. Uh, I didn't do it on the front page of this presentation because my name was right there. It's pretty clear. Who, to, in my mind, who the, the rights holder is. Um, I, I hope that's clear. But this really is the best practice here. They've provided information about the rights holder and they've made it clear that they're making it available under the CC uh, by SA license. That's the best practice. Because when you're using other people's work, you want to know what they are okay with you doing. And this makes it very clear. It's not always the case. And now I want to move into talking about copyright and using third-party content in an OER. Now, if you haven't heard that phrase before, third-party content, it, it's just a kind of a legal way of saying work for which you do not hold the rights, okay? So the easiest way to do this, to include other people's work in an OER, is just to find content that's already available for that use. And we'll talk about that. Or you can ask the rights holder for permission and there are templates that I'm going to share with you that help you do that. Or you can assess whether a statutory exception to infringement might apply to your use and that gets a little grayer. So we're going to cover the less gray stuff first. Um, the easiest thing to do really is find content that is available for use in an OER and we've talked a lot about this already so I'm not going to belabor it. Um, there's a link here to a copyright term flowchart that we created here at the U of A. We'll probably be updating it in January uh, or thereabouts. So if you want to figure out if something is no longer protected by copyright, that is what you would do. Also, if you're not using more uh, a substantial amount, then it's not protected by copyright. If it's an insubstantial amount, you, you don't have to worry so much about copyright. But that is something that is interpreted as well. And facts aren't covered by copyright. Terms of use that support inclusion in an OER though is really probably where the bulk of your material is going to come from. And we've talked a lot about that already. Um, you can also create new stuff, right? Uh, okay, let's see. I just look at the time here, ask the rights holder for permission to use the work. If you can identify them and contact them, there are templates that I've linked here for your use. If you can't identify them and contact them, there are other things you can do, like applying for an unlocatable copyright or owner license from the Copyright Board of Canada. That does take a bit of time um, and it's um, sometimes just easier to find another work. There's so many resources now out there with a CC license that's compatible with OER and this is just one of the tools. There are many and again I'd refer you to the module that's just come up on the screen if you need to dive into that. Um, a lot of conversation about statutory exceptions to infringement in the OER space. Um, 
I don't have a bullet list here, and this is one of those cases where I couldn't find a good OER licensed image, so I just created one. <laughs> uh, we have to think about fairness, right? If we're going to if we're going to talk about fair dealing and using um, third party content in an OER, you have to talk about fairness. And and our act doesn't give us a lot of information on this. This is literally what it says in this realm, in this in this scenario. Uh, Section 29 says fair dealing for the purpose of research, private study, education, parody, or satire does not infringe copyright. Well, that sounds great. We know that it allows for use of materials without payment or permission. But what the heck does fair dealing mean, right? Like, how do we know if the dealing is fair? And that's the gray. And as I said earlier, there's no OER case law that we can lean on in Canada. We do do know that the courts will use multiple factors in making a fair dealing determination, but you know what? It's got to get to that level if we really want to understand how the courts are going to interpret it with OER. And bringing it back to ownership, if, if you make, uh, if you help develop an OER and you're using third party content, who is the person or institution that's going to make the fair dealing argument? Is it you? Um, is it your institution? That depends on who owns the work. Um, I made this PowerPoint, uh, or sorry, this, uh, I hate PowerPoint. I made this Google slide deck. Uh, it's my responsibility. It's my copyright. If there is a, if I'm leaning on fair dealing, I need to be ready to explain why I thought that was justified. It's my responsibility. And, um, and that's a conversation you have to have with OER developers if you're choosing to lean on fair dealing. Uh, as far as I'm aware, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, my understanding is that institutional fair dealing guidelines do not support the type of distribution that is, um, you know, just basic to OER. So I'm not saying fair dealing is not available. Of course it's available, but we don't have clarity on when in the Canadian landscape. There is a, a group though in the US at MIT that has been using um, fair use, which is the US sort of sibling uh, provision around exceptions to infringement uh, in this space. And um, I think they spent seven years getting this program off the ground. Uh, MIT was a leader early on in developing open courseware of which open educational resources is, is you know, um, included. And, and they do have staff that are trained to make fair use assessments and judgments when including third party content into their OER. I don't know um, of any other institution that is exercising that level of risk tolerance. Um, uh, but if you do, I'd love to hear about it. There's a lot more information on the website. And, um, and one of the things that they, they've done is help the people at MIT and, and others, it's actually a long list of people that contributed to this code of best practices. This is helping them make those decisions about when it's okay to use um, third party content in an OER. Uh, so, so that's a really progressive and, um, and helpful uh, use of or reliance on user rights. Um, there was a, a talk a few years ago, then I, I think it was somebody from Columbia saying, who said that, you know, fair use is not civil disobedience. And, and I think the MIT example to be leaders in this space exemplifies that very well. Uh, but I don't know of any Canadian institutions that are doing anything similar. Uh, so there's that. And we come back to the question. Is including third-party content in OER fair? Uh, I can't tell you if it is or not. It's a case-by-case -case situation. What we do know from our Supreme Court is that they, these factors are likely to be considered if there was a case, but there could be others. Um, they're going to ask about how, what your dealing was, right? What was your purpose? And I think in the space of OER, we can safely say it's education. Um, and the character is very broad. Uh, so those, you know, education would lean towards fair dealing, uh, character, broad distribution, and historically that has leaned away from fair dealing, less fair. Amount is likely to be substantial to entire, and whether or not you had alternatives available to you is going to depend on the case at hand. So you can't, it, you can see why it's difficult to say with any sort of confidence, yay or nay, uh, when you're talking about this. They're also going to consider um, what the original work was like. What was the creator's intent? What was the nature of the work in the first place? Was this something that was widely made available on the open web or was it something that was behind a paywall and you took from a space that was quite locked down? That, that makes a difference. 
And of course, what was the effect of the dealing on the work? All right, so um, in summary, because I wanted to leave a lot of time for questions, um, copyright is a limited enclosure mechanism. So it, it does provide rights holders with a lot of rights and users with less rights, but they're very important rights in our system. And open licenses are an infrastructural element of OER that can be assigned by the rights holder. And that's going to be who that is in, in an educational institution is going to depend on a number of factors. The default, again, in the Copyright Act is for the employer to hold the rights unless there's an agreement to the contrary. And finally, when using third party content in an OER, um, you basically have three options. Uh, find something that has supportive terms of use, like a supportive CC license. Find permission, ask for permission, or you know, lean on those user rights, a statutory exception to infringement, but with all the caveats and information that we've already discussed, because we don't have any case law to give us clarity in this area. And just so you know, in case we don't get here later, I have linked to a few th things, including the CC Certificate for Educators and Librarians, really helpful, really useful program. Um, and I think I am ready for questions. Thank you so much, Amanda. This is very useful. Um, so there are a few questions. First from Kate. Can a uh, non-derivatives work sometimes be used in an open textbook? So for example, could an ND case study from a website be put into an open text? Yes, if, if you're not triggering that ND element. And what I mean by that is if you're not changing um, anything in the case. So the CC, this is assuming it's the entire CC by ND license. So the CC by, uh, the, like the, the base part of the license does allow for reproduction. The ND only uh, comes into effect, is only triggered, so to speak, if you're adapting it, if you're modifying it. If you're just taking that case as produced and reproducing it, my understanding of the terms is that that is supported. And there's actually a lot of discussion about that because it is an area of confusion. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about that on the wiki and also I think in the Slack. I think in the Slack channel there's been a few conversations about that, but definitely on the wiki and that's definitely covered in the certificate program and the materials, course materials from that program are openly available from the link in the presentation. Great question though, it comes up a lot, thank you. Thank you. So if someone is creating an OER with their students, they need to make sure they have agreement from each student involved based on the individual IP policy of a given school. Is that correct? Uh, it would be dependent on the IP policy at the school, but usually, uh, as I understand it, and certainly here at U of A, the student would own the rights in any work they create. So the students are not employees of the university, and that's important to understand. Uh, it's an important distinction not many people are think about. Why would they, right? Uh, so employees must follow the copyright policies of the employer, obviously, uh, but the students aren't. They would have a, a code of behavior that would be specific to students that may or may not include anything about IP. Uh, most of the material created in the course of their studies would be held by them, so they would own. The exception would be if they are creating those resources as part of an RA ship, perhaps, or employment. Um, so if they're employed by the library as a student, but they're creating materials, well, that, there's probably an employment contract and a collective agreement that would specify the, whether or not that employee held the rights. But if it's strictly classroom-based, assignment, um, no employment considerations, the student would normally hold the rights. So yes, if, if, they're, if the professor, let's say, is assigning a CC license to that work, yeah, they can't do that without the student's permission. And the student should understand uh, what that license means. Great. I hope I answered the question. Great. When I remix a resource, what is the role for choosing the license of my creation? What is the role? Sorry? The rule for oh, the using the license of the new creation of a remixed resource. What is the rule? Well, it would depend on the terms of the specific license. Uh, so if you're, if it's CC BY, for example, or I think that this is for all of them, maybe, it's, um, except the ones that don't allow for distribution after adaptation, but the ones that allow for modification and distribution, like CC BY, uh, it, you have to say how it was changed. So you, 
there, there are good examples of this out there, if, especially with handouts. A lot of libraries will take handouts created by other institutions that have a CC BY license, modify it, and put it out there. Uh, so, so that's a good place to find examples of how that's done. Um, when in doubt, always like, I mean, this is separate from the license, but it's just always good practice to tell people how you've changed other people's work. And, and that's, uh, I hope that answered the question. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you have any convincing arguments for faculty for why they should consider open licensing for their work? Some are very uneasy with ceding control that their work for fear that it might be misinterpreted or misused. Yeah, and, and I wish I had a one, a really quick response. Um, it really depends on the nature of the materials and the professor. I think in most cases, teaching materials, it's pretty, um, you know, the, the professor, the instructor has been hired to educate. They're being remunerated for creating the works. They're not usually going to be in a situation where they're being remunerated beyond that. So holding back um, commerciality may or may not be relevant. Um, there's always the visibility and impact argument that's pretty clear and we have a lot of evidence to show that sharing things with an open license does improve visibility and impact and in an academic environment really reputation is currency. Um, if they want to be seen as someone who, who is dedicated to education, uh, then using open licenses is kind of a heads up that they understand that sharing is is a good way to do that so um yeah it really depends on the culture and that can vary by department and sometimes it's surprising <laughs> and, and sometimes i mean i've talked to units where you know it, let's say we have 10 people in one academic unit and they don't agree mm -hmm. uh so it, it's it's a very personal thing and um yeah uh, it's going to depend on on culture right uh, so this is a, a question that I see a lot, so um, it's good that uh, Eric has asked it, but can I use uh, non-commercial as someone producing content for a course at a university that charges student tuition? Okay, so uh, non-commercial use, um, the, com the commercial nature of the use depends on the use, not the user. So um, that's, that's that's kind of key. The cost recovery has generally been seen as, as non-commercial. So I would actually refer you to the wiki pages. I, I'm, there was a, a court case. Now, I should have said earlier, the, the CC licenses have been tested in court multiple times. And there's actually a, a Wikipedia page that lists those. One of the court cases was about this very scenario. And in that particular case, the use was, was seen to be within the terms of the license. So short answer without a lot of more specifics, usually, <laughs> but, um, um, but yeah, I, obviously I can't provide legal advice and there's information on the Wikipedia site that lists court cases related to CC licenses that might be a lot better at flushing that out than I can do. There are also some people on, on the chat that, were, that took the CC certificate with me as well, so, or previous years, so if they have any more clarity, you know, please, uh, I think Uju might be sharing something. Yeah, uh, all the uh, links that are being shared in the chat, I'll make sure that those go out with the uh, content. Yeah, both Roger uh, and Uju have shared it there, so that's great. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, so another question, can you expand on the practical issue of the share-alike license? If a faculty member adapts a textbook from BC Campus, for example, do they need to add that adapted text to the BC Campus repository, or is it sufficient to make it available in an institutional repository or a personal website or some other place? Um, well, how you distribute the work is separate from the terms of the license. Um, the platform might be something that is a function of the funder, maybe, I'm not sure. So um, sometimes if there's funding to create an OER, they might, the funder may have specify where you deposit or which license you're using. And the share alike would only become um, a, a factor, again, if, if you're modifying, if you're including third party content with a share alike license and modifying it. If you're creating a brand new work, a brand new textbook and putting a share alike license on it, then other people 
Um, it depends on their letter level of literacy. They may or may not see that as a barrier. It ca does cause a lot of confusion. Um, but I think the important thing to, to remember is that it's only triggered when there's a modification and sharing. Um, but yeah, platform is, is, is a separate issue from, from the license in, a, in, in the capacity we're talking about it here today anyway. Uh, I had a question um, because you did mention the U.S. in terms of um, the idea of, of fair dealing or sorry, it's not fair dealing, but you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so in Canada, like I think the universities or at least me here at UBC is really waiting for an instance of where somebody will push the fair dealing and issue inside of an open education resource. Um, have you seen that actually happening where people are using content under that notion of fair dealing in an OER? Um, the MIT example, I know it's US based, but the MIT example is the best one I think that I've come across. Uh, I, I do, unfortunately I know of the opposite. I know of cases where instructors have wanted to lean on fair dealing, but because the OER was being developed under the institutional mantle, they they would they needed to make, kind of clear that fair dealing use with um with the institution and we're told no i know of a couple of cases where yes. that's happened i don't know off the top of my head um i mean not institutionally i think individually you could probably find uh, cases but um mm -hmm. but yeah I, i'd love to hear if if, if there are institutions yeah that, me too. I think that example is great. It'd be great. You know what would be wonderful um, is if we could, in Canada, mm -hmm. create a code of best practices in fair dealing for open courseware mm -hmm. here in Canada. That's probably a first step right. to, you know, work towards institutional mm -hmm. adoption of, of those exceptions right. for this purpose. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so I think I, that's all the questions that were in the chat. Did anybody else have a quick? <laughs> oh, hey, there we go. Lillian's uh, actually got a great comment. Yay, thank you, Lillian. She says, we encourage the use of fair dealing exception for text published on the eCampus Ontario Library. That's fantastic. Can I ask how you um, assess whether or not um, a use is fair? Do you have um, best practices that, that we could learn from? Yeah, so um, I'll do, I'll talk somebody through a fair uh, dealing analysis uh, for any scenario. And we usually try to get somebody to a place where they feel confident that they've done their due diligence with a fair uh, dealing analysis. So we usually rely on the educational exception uh, or sort of the educational dealing as well as purpose, um, yeah. purpose yeah. Um, and then we sort of just go through the alternatives um, as well and then we have some best practices around licensing and statements that folks can use to indicate very clearly what content in their text is being used under the fair dealing exception or under fair dealing and um, which content is openly licensed we do the same for no derivatives licensed uh, work as long as they're not making a derivative that's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's a really important first step. So have you had any pushback from rights holders? And the MIT article actually goes into detail about pushback from an academic publisher on this point. So I'm just, yeah, have you had any questions or cease and dis or sorry, take down note, anything like that? Uh, we haven't yet, no. <laughs> so perhaps we've been lucky, but, <laughs> you know, um, we we always tell people it's sort of a balance of you feeling that you're very able to argue, you're able to argue your case um, and you uh, assessing the likelihood of somebody to be litigious because the fair fair dealing is almost always uh, dictated even though there is a legal uh, structure around it it's often dictated by the litigiousness of the of the rights holder and not the actual law itself. Yeah, copyright chill is, is a very real thing, and the more litigation that, that is, um, how do I put this, that is opaque to the average person, uh, the, the worse I think copyright anxiety and chill become. Uh, fair dealing is, is supposed to um, 
I mean, it's a balancing test, right? It, it's it's if, if the if the use is serving the public interest in a way that is more important than the the rights that are being um, not taken away because it's intellectual property, but the rights that are that are being um, able to be exploited by the rights holder, then it, then the use should be fair. Uh, and, and it's it's fantastic that that those steps are being taken by eCampus Ontario, and, and I hope that you'll that you'll write that up or share it, and um, and that there's some interest to to work towards a best practice for fair dealing in Canada. Yeah, we would love that. <laughs> Excellent! Yay! The gauntlet's been thrown there, uh, BC Campus. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, I don't see any more questions. So Amanda, I just wanted to thank you for this really important webinar. Um, a lot of information here and I think uh, more people will be, or everybody is asking that we're sharing this. So <laughs> you can see there's a lot of excitement. So thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Okay, well, thank you everybody for attending and have a good day.